Good, good morning, everybody here in the room, and good morning also to our followers on the internet. Um, we are again live streaming this this event. Um, a, a, quick, a, a, a quick few notes for for today's session. Um, again, if you haven't done yet, these are the Wi-Fi codes uh, shown here. If you want to tweet or send some LinkedIn messages, please use hashtag EU underline Arise and at Aritrain underline EU. Um, we had something like 50 or 52 uh, tweets uh, during yesterday's afternoon session. That was quite nice to see. Thank you for all of you retweeting uh, and tweeting uh, about the different sessions. You will receive um, an evaluation uh, feedback survey by email. If you want to do it right now, you can use that link um, just to give us also feedback on, 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 on the conference, on the workshop here. Um, and also the reimbursement forms um, will be sent then via email. Um, quick over overview of uh, today. Um, we are very grateful to have uh, George Rossi with us giving uh, the keynote about research infrastructures and uh, feedback survey yeah. by email if by the training session, as I mentioned uh, yesterday already, uh, organized by Elisabetta Marafiotti. Thank you very much for, for having done that. Um, we will then have, uh, so we will switch into a different tool for training and exchange, namely the uh, RI Train Staff Exchange Program um, and people from uh, have, who have participated in those activities both as hosts as well as participants will uh, feedback their experience and I'm, I'm sure we will have a lively discussion there as well. Um, then we go into the structured breakout sessions. Uh, we will start with an with a, a opening reflection from Nicholas. Uh, and then we have, we have three parallel uh, focus groups, namely barriers and solutions to our RI management training in the Rubens room, that's this one here, um, chaired by Maria Luisa Lavitrano and Enrico uh, Guarini. Second one, recruiting and retaining personnel in RIs, that was the Leopold room, remember, upstairs. You just go out, go up, um, it's easy to reach where we were last uh, yesterday and the third one stakeholder engagement it's always the mobile of the speaker I'm sorry so if you haven't switched off your mobile please do it now um, and the last one the stakeholder engagement in the Marie Therese room and uh, we are happy to have uh, Richard Kidney from Imperial College to chair that part then we come back reconvene wrap up and a few words at the end. And I'm handing over to Maria Luisa to introduce Giorgio Rossi, please. Okay. Now, this is in French, someone needs to help me. How do you start presentation in PDF in French? A French speaker, please. PDF. Fenetre no. means window. Who speaks French? Hey, come on. <laughs> Not a single person. I don't believe so. Yannick, how do you start? <laughs> yes. What, what do you want to do? Start the presentation mode in PDF. This is a PDF? Yes. yes. So usually it's, it's, it's Control L. Perfect. Control? Control L. L. We need, definitely, we need infrastructures. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends. It's a pleasure and an honor to introduce you uh, Giorgio Rossi. Giorgio Rossi is a professor at the University of Milano, which is a different one from Milano Bicocca, by the way, our mother university, and also uh, is he, he has uh, actually has been chair of ESPRI and also now is chairing the high level group for long term sustainability of research infrastructure. And today he will give a talk on research infrastructure as test beds for EOSC, training the scientists and future 
practitioners. Thank you very much, Giorgio, for coming, and welcome to the podium. Thank you, Maria Luisa. Thank you uh, for this uh, uh, initiative, uh, offering me the opportunity of talking about on this um, title that I was given. And so I will try to develop this. So the European Open Science Cloud, in uh, my vision, is the start of a process towards establishing an interoperable research resource for Europe. The start, the European Open Science Cloud deals with data, open access to data, interoperability of data, but introduces the concept of interoperability that has a bigger impact, uh, and uh, I think it will develop, be developed in the future as, as a bigger impact in uh, the um, old research system. So it's key for uh, its own goals and for a, a paradigmatic move on of the old uh, research uh, resources. Uh, the research infrastructures have a fundamental role for the construction of the EOSC because they must populate the open science cloud with high quality data. High quality can be proven only by the scientific community, cannot be proven by any algorithm or technology, and uh, reliable and innovative data services that again are in the hands of the scientists to contribute developing but to proving uh, the reliability and uh, um, usefulness. Um, competencies and training uh, to keep the data science strongly anchored to research. And this is something that I believe is very important. The success of the cloud is if it is if it becomes a real um, strength of the research system. Um, as it is organized now, the EOSC very quickly, uh, it has a, a governance board where the member states are represented, and uh, this governance board has a dialogue with an executive board, um, having formed a number of working groups, we will see uh, what they do, and uh, they this ensemble of experts uh, produce um, ideas, recommendations, suggestions that are taken on board by the governance board and then these other objects around uh, complete the interactions. Of course, very important are the um, Horizon 2020 uh, funded uh, projects and uh, as well as the nationally funded projects and uh, um, the reorganization that is already taking place at uh, many uh, national levels of the doers that are implied <coughs> in the construction of the EOSC. So first stage of the EOSC is what is happening now. There is a mandate to complete by the end of 2020 uh, a first uh, possible um, structure for starting officially 2021 with the new framework program, uh, the EOSC as, uh, not as a project, but as a, a beginning uh, reality. Uh, has to do with data, with services, with architecture, uh, access rules, rules of participation, and of course, uh, the governance. And to build it, you need competencies, you need uh, data scientists, in larger number than available. Data stewards, something that does not yet exist uh, as, a, as a professional definition, but we will understand that these are the necessary interfaces between the scientists and the EOSC to convince the scientists that it can be done without waste of time, it can be done with big advantage. So these are um, uh, figures that must be formed, and again, the research infrastructures can play a central role in, in the formation of these professionalities. Um, and then, of course, a general uh, data literacy, data alphabetization of the European research area and of the innovation uh, world. 
So the governing board uh, strategic implementation plan has set the priorities, understanding the landscape, understanding how to implement the fair uh, data principles, uh, defining corresponding requirements for the development of the ser EOSC services, uh, the architecture, so the technical framework, the rules of participation, who is in from the beginning and how to move to a more and more comprehensive uh, EOSC and its uh, sustainability, providing a set of recommendations that <coughs> concern implementation of operational, scalable, and sustainable um, EOSC federation. And these are the list, not just of principles, but of duties to be uh, sketched, at least in a first viable uh, configuration uh, at the end of next year. And this uh, first viable uh, um, or minimum viable uh, product uh, for the moment is called or is being developed around the concept of a federating uh, core, uh, federating of uh, existing uh, research infrastructures and uh, new research infrastructures. And this should build uh, on existing things uh, on the most advanced let's say, uh, research infrastructures concerning the data management and the openness uh, of uh, access to data, uh, smart ways to access uh, to the sophisticated resources of these um, infrastructures. Um, the federating core relies on the research infrastructure for transferring, storing, processing, preserving the data, and this will be a, a guarantee also of a low risk uh, for this federating core that uh, in case it doesn't work or it doesn't work as well as expected, still the data uh, remain with the research infrastructures that are long-term undertakings. And uh, um, the sustainability, of course, of this federating core is strongly dependent on the uh, infrastructures that will contribute being both research infrastructure and e-infrastructure. And then there are discussion, of course, about the governance. Uh, recently, uh, considerations were made about uh, uh, the fact that the EOSC might uh, require a, a, a robust uh, legal structure, uh, a resilient legal structure that down the line should be maybe in the shape of a joint undertaking, but that may take time and EOS has to become a reality quick enough and so there are uh, discussions on the strategic partnership models, uh, co-program uh, in particular that have been proposed by the commission. Now, uh, from the infrastructure side, of course, uh, several of you may remember that ESFRI uh, listed a number of recommendations uh, that were actually adopted by the Council in 2017 uh, concerning uh, optimization and coordination of member state investment strategies in the e-infrastructures. And one of the points that is relevant for us today is that ESFRI advised that urgent actions uh, must be taken to support training and hiring of e-infrastructure experts and scientists to expand the data literacy at all levels of education and innovation activities to enable the return on investment in e infrastructure and research infrastructure and maximize the societal um, benefits. So among the points uh, that S3 also always has uh, stressed is the uh, provision and use and control, I would say, of high quality scientific data, so quality control. Uh, effective descriptors, so what is uh, usually uh, called the metadata, and then of course ease of access, interoperability, and so on, which are things that are developed to different degrees in the existing infrastructures, not only the ESPRI, but all those that populate the European research area. And uh, um, some of the best um, results Hopefully, all the best results from this infrastructure will be federated in, such, in an effective way, which means they will not be screened by a, 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 a non-transparent layer on top of that. They will be fully evident, and uh, 
The, the advantage is that they will become more and more interoperable so that the user who knows already where to go because there's a specific need goes to the specific infrastructure, but then new users uh, who have to explore or who need uh, to have access to different kind of data through the EOSC uh, would be able to uh, obtain the, the most advanced um, um, services uh, that are present from the, from the very uh, beginning. So uh, in the life cycle of the scientific data, uh, we could uh, sort of break down uh, uh, these, uh, these aspects. And again, I underline where research infrastructures are important, where data collection, of course, uh, users, scientists, and in particular those using research infrastructure are at the source, and so they are the immediate first uh, level of quality check. Scientists, they know if they collected good data or if the data are not worth uh, further um, ad hoc. And uh, so creation of a robust, fair uh, data sets on robust data that contain information. Um, that is one uh, of the key uh, elements at the beginning that concerns the infrastructures, <coughs> metadata production by the scientists. Uh, I wrote, as automated as possible. This is an important thing that has to do with research infrastructures. Uh, metadata must allow uh, a, a new uh, scientist to take full advantage of the information that is contained in the data set to extract some new knowledge. And uh, this can be done only if the data are very well described, but to do this metadata is uh, uh, time consuming and it's complicated and it's an engaging part of work that maybe not all scientists see at first uh, how rewarding for them it could be. And uh, this is an issue, but it can be, at least in uh, several types of infrastructure, uh, largely uh, made automatic. So they, this means investment. Investment in research infrastructures, and the research infrastructure may be happy, and the scientists may be happy that investment is done in hardware and in interfaces, in systems, in software that accumulates, creates large part of the metadata with the human contribution uh, being therefore limited only to a high level uh, intellectual organization of metadata. Uh, then there are things that are more on the technical side, uh, not saying that this is less intriguing, but this is not in the hands of the scientists, the identifiers of the data sets and the hierarchical archiving um, are more for, um, for pure data scientists. Then fair services to the data, access according to priority. Uh, storage can be uh, hierarchically uh, organized. Uh, data that are not required, uh, don't require immediate access can be stored uh, on tapes. Uh, data that required or that for a period of time required immediate access have higher uh, level um, storage solutions. Uh, transfer data, how much data need to be transferred, so the networks, the, the optical fibers, the services, the national services that connected in Giant allow the data to go around must uh, be um, solicited to understand how much new traffic uh, will be determined by, by the EOSC or how much uh, data analysis will be done at the infrastructure and so there will not be huge uh, data sets uh, moving around the networks. So all these things need to be understood and you need people to do that. Um, data analysis software, again here research, researchers and researchers in the research infrastructure are called to uh, a, a primary role in defining the an data analysis uh, services. Uh, open source software is certainly one of the elements. Uh, uh, high power computing, high throughput uh, computing services uh, are part of this um, chapter. And uh, good libraries of data statistics. This would be a very important element for EOSC. We know how much in very important domains like health or like uh, uh, environment, uh, often 
is uh, poor statistics that leads to um, unreliable results and uh, uh, the EOSC could make available a, a strong culture and tools to apply the, the, the correct um, data analysis to very diversified, um, very different fields of, uh, of research. And then the data set access rules and uh, uh, of course as we uh, um, interface the so-called uh, Gutenberg uh, uh, paradigm, so publications on papers, uh, there is uh, the issue of access to the publications, but the new issue is access of the data that originated those <coughs> publications. So uh, human resources are needed for the EOSC and for the research infrastructure to be ready of the EOSC, but the research infrastructures are builders of the EOSC. And so here we see uh, that there are two roles. Um, a number of things have to be based on the research infrastructure and federated into the EOSC. Um, data scientists are needed uh, for research infrastructures and they need to have formation, training, at data production, and data analysis facilities to be close to science. Generic big data experts have very important uh, competencies but may not be entirely suitable for the needs of research infrastructure and of the EOSC. Uh, in, a, in a general big data management, uh, there is a throwaway stage that because you have to optimize the economy and once the data are not um, sellable uh, at a decent price anymore, they're thrown away. Uh, in research, for the moment, we believe that we, we don't want to throw away. Uh, certainly time series or, or unique data sets cannot be thrown away. So it's a different approach uh, than the general uh, big data approach. And uh, uh, so if the research infrastructure and the EOSC are to be understood as public goods, they need a special approach to data quality, metadata curation, and long-term preservation of time series and unique observation. S3 in the past has uh, um, put together a, a report, uh, the S3 script number two, from a, um, an expert group uh, that had to address the issues of long-term sustainability of research infrastructures, and one chapter was about ensuring right people at the right place at the right time, and this has to do with the scientists, with the management, with the users uh, to be trained to uh, get the most of the um, um, results out of the access uh, to the infrastructures and some suggestions of actions that could be taken only at uh, European scale or that could be taken, uh, that should be taken at, at a national scale to optimize the development of competencies to make optimal use of the research infrastructures. And one part of the considerations were also uh, concerning um, concerning um, uh, the data, and it was formulated uh, like uh, European national authorities and the Commission should take effective measures to create synergies between the research infrastructure and the e-infrastructure to facilitate service provision, provision, data, and metadata integration. And uh, the goal is fostering the adoption of incentives and effective measures to establish synergies between research infrastructure. Now, today all of this is clearly under the label uh, EOSC, but it's a, it's a consciousness that, uh, that is present in a research infrastructure um, since, uh, since a few years, and uh, um, we uh, have to uh, find the most efficient ways to reach, um, to satisfy these needs. Uh, but let me add uh, one aspect that to me is interesting. Uh, the research infrastructure, as it has been uh, well described in the, in the 2018 roadmap, uh, roadmap uh, landscape analysis, are evolving 
from originally standalone um, enterprises, infrastructures, and they are becoming more and more part of a connected ecosystem. Uh, forming a unique resource for advanced research. And what you see on the right there is one page of the roadmap where the exercise was to see the direct implications, the direct influence, the direct um, usefulness of research infrastructures that nominally belong to one of these disciplinary blocks of uh, energy and environmental sciences and uh, health and food and physics or social and cultural innovation, but they do impact also on the other fields, for the research on the other fields. And this is already a picture of what is occurring. It's not a vision, it's just taking note of how uh, important are data from the environment for understanding health and society. This is quite obvious, but also uh, from uh, uh, energy to these uh, same dimensions and uh, from physics uh, to uh, many of the, other, uh, of the other domains. So data and data analytics interoperability uh, is a need and it's in the perspective on the EOSC and beyond. And of course, can be developed first at near neighbor level. Thematic clusters are in part addressing that, and it is occurring. And then expand across fields, realizing interdisciplinarity. And uh, to do that, scientists, I think, will be willing and available to align to this paradigm. But you need properly trained data scientists and data stewards and we need to form them. And this formation should be a joint effort of academies and research infrastructures. Because uh, these um, figures are uh, scarce now and uh, uh, maybe not yet fully optimized for, for the needs, for the jobs. So um, research infrastructures have to be recognized as key elements in the higher education and training for European researchers in all domains. This is partially happening, but it's not structurally organized yet. Uh, the credit system and, and uh, what would really make the research infrastructure a building block of the higher education. And uh, um, this education should start uh, at master, uh, of course, at doctoral levels, but even uh, earlier, perhaps, uh, in, the, uh, in the education career. And uh, um, it's uh, uh, expand covering, of course, uh, the data uh, management aspects and the access to data uh, as an important thing. So how to make it uh, sustainable, human resource, uh, sustainable plan for human resources, um, define appropriate technical profiles and the evaluation system for research infrastructure managers and operators, including, of course, uh, the data. Create by training the key role of data steward. Uh, I know that we are addressing in, in my own uh, scientific activity uh, these, just picking up. Uh, young persons that are curious about a job that is not described and that learn uh, uh, to do that. And this is really the key interface between the scientists because if the scientists at this stage must be taken by hand and explained that they will not waste time, they, they will not uh, um, pay for something that they don't see how it, uh, it comes back, the data steward. Uh, helps and, and takes part of the burden. And, and this is important to, to create a, a collaborative um, effort and culture. Um, reduce the knowledge divide between managers, operators, and scientist users, facilities. This is very important. This has to do more with the uh, qualifying uh, managers of research infrastructures. Uh, they should be become in knowledgeable enough or acquainted enough with the scientific uh, way of thinking and operating 
to be good managers and vice versa. The scientists must learn how to speak to managers correctly. Um, keep an eye on excellent people that reach retirement age uh, still being extremely active. They are systematically uh, attracted by China at this time. And they can spend another very useful five to ten years of their career to the benefit not of Europe, I mean indirectly, I mean we are a world community, but anyhow we are missing this and let's think about that. There are, until the competencies in managing research infrastructure will not be very abundant, don't lose the uh, experienced people that are still willing and, 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 uh, and creative enough to, to fulfill uh, uh, some role. And then of course we have to draw career paths uh, that should make interesting for a scientist to do some service uh, in a research infrastructure without seeing that as a, as a, as a severe interruption of the scientific uh, career, without seeing that as cutting bridges with respect to uh, coming back to the academic or, or public research or uh, a no return um, um, option uh, because we need more and more uh, brilliant and knowledgeable people and ambitious people to get into that. So um, a few words on the high level expert group, what it is doing. Uh, it is doing a service for the commission, has been created by the commission with a clear mandate that will end at the end of this year, so start at 1st of January, will finish 31st of December 2019, and uh, uh, to address uh, some issues like effectiveness of the measures of the uh, framework programs to support uh, the past framework programs to support research infrastructures and collect some ideas on what are the perceived bottlenecks for the future. Uh, sustainability of the infrastructures, and so this is what we are trying to do. And in doing that, uh, I go quickly through this idea because it may have implications. This is just our proposal, it's not a, a, a decision of the Commission, of course, we are only advising. But it's a way of thinking that may have implications also on how to manage the infrastructures and uh, uh, where to build in, uh, when to build in the, the um, EOSC uh, um, competencies. So this is the, the, the life cycle and uh, we have drafted a uh, ladder of readiness levels to describe how an infrastructure is moving along its um, life cycle and uh, we have identified the readiness levels according to the fulfillment of uh, some uh, conditions, some key milestones, and uh, we, have, uh, we are preparing uh, a report for that. So just going very quickly, uh, only to the scope of this uh, discussion, the first readiness level of an infrastructure is design study, conceptual design report, initial agreement with the three member states, readiness to apply to the S3 roadmap. This is what, we, uh, what is known as the access. But here you see then it follows the preparation and in the preparation years that typically for the S3 are, should be less than 10 uh, total years, you have a first a readiness level number two that includes technical design study, complete, advanced architecture of the infrastructure, siting option when it's relevant, uh, cost book, and data management plan. The data management plan comes in early in the design. It's a part of the technical design study. It has to be. Nowadays, a new project cannot start without having built in uh, directly this, um, uh, this part because it is a structuring part. Uh, then readiness level three will be more concentrated to advanced financial plan, consortium plan, uh, management of all the um, resources uh, for um, building the infrastructure and then it comes the implementation and construction readiness level four uh, all the legal uh, and, and the stable consortium uh, with financial commitment, uh, uh, enough 
to reach the critical mass to really construct. And uh, the operation phase, of course, again, is the established infrastructure. Construction in, is completed. Operational budget is in place. Uh, can be an ERIC, uh, a, a landmark, uh, aeroforums, uh, etc. Uh, delivery of science result, open access to the users, science services, services for innovation, open data facilities, fair services, and then uh, continuous upgrade. So at RL5, you have to have this operational, has to be built. Per completely designed in the, in the um, technical report level, so RL2. So the high-level group proposes a way that the infrastructure could move along this ladder, but this is not so important to be discussed uh, now. But you see that there is a structure of management where the competencies of, of the life cycle, where the competencies are needed from, from a very uh, early um, stage. So uh, the EOSC, building the EOSC, if we look now at the reverse, what the EOSC can, boot, can be good for the infrastructures have, after having said how the infrastructure have to build the EOSC, the EOSC can play an effective structuring effect to the research infrastructures from the readiness level two to the clustering uh, thematic uh, or even across thematic clustering, uh, that is the readiness level six. The goal of populating the uh, ecosystem includes increasing diversity and com complementarity of infrastructure. This would apply to any new project coming, for example, to the S3 roadmap or coming to the attention of national um, um, authorities for populating the, the European research area. Uh, interoperability of the data and interoperability of the infrastructure is a need for future sustainability and compliance uh, with the EOSC. And this must be addressed and practiced through all the implementation stages again. So from RL2 uh, to RL5 that is operation and then clustering. Uh, and the correct mixture of research and service must be built in the governance and the management as well as in the uh, human uh, resource plan. So the research infrastructure must be attractive for ambitious scientists and productive for a very broad interdisciplinary community going also to um, the innovation. Uh, some of that has been said. So let me uh, conclude saying that the impact of uh, the efforts symbolized to some degree by, by the EOSC idea is interoperability of the data. And my idea is this is a step towards interoperability of the research infrastructures. So interoperability of the data production stage, not only of the access of uh, data that have been produced before. Let me qualify this point, make it clear at least what I think. Um, the EOSC, when it will work perfectly, will give seamless, uh, effective access to data sets. This is great. The potential is that it will foster interdisciplinarity. The potential is that it will make reuse of some data sets uh, a, a value. But these data sets exist only because researchers have taken them and researchers move along disciplinary coordinates. Complex demands of new knowledge from the society the great challenges, the, the societal issues, are complex by definition and may require data that are not there because there was no purely disciplinary issue that motivated some scientists to produce them. So if we move towards an interoperable research system, there should be an entry point that allows to distribute bits of a complex question to those infrastructures that could produce those data easily. But that if you wait that 
on the basis of disciplinary need, some group will produce those data, you may wait a year while they are needed soon. So this is my concept of the interoperable research infrastructure or research resource uh, system. And the EOSC is what we have to do now, but keeping in mind that it's a structuring building block for, for the future, my vision of the future of research infrastructure. So uh, I think I've said enough. I filled my half an hour. I thank you for the attention. <laughs> Thank you, Giorgio, for this inspiring talk. And uh, now it's open for uh, questions from the floor. Lots of questions. Do we have uh, a microphone? We microphone today, but I, I think people OK, so speak loud. So stand up and speak loud. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Luisa. Michela Velico from Maxeleric. Uh, how many levels do we have in the uh, readiness level uh, um, scale that you proposed? Because you, you mentioned five, but I saw in one of your slides number six. So I'm, I'm curious to know what readiness level six is, if, if it exists. Thank it you. Does. It does. It, it also exists the readiness level seven. But the readiness level seven is ready to dismantle, ready to terminate. <laughs> we, we all start from birth to be ready to die, right, at one point. So the, the life cycle of an infrastructure may con be concluded. I don't to dwell on that part. Uh, also because most of our research infrastructure are young enough that uh, they still have to prove uh, RL5, so an operation stage for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years in some cases. The RL6, uh, which I didn't um, describe here, uh, is the idea that infrastructure merge their action. Doesn't mean necessarily uh, institutionally merging, but that's exemplified by the clustering and by the fact that of becoming more and more interoperable, at least at thematic level, and then expanding. This is typically addressed by some infrastructures that have already a good um, track of active operation, and they engage in that, uh, uh, in that level. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's five levels. The, the fifth level is the fully operational uh, infrastructure and uh, that should last, that has the long-term sustainability issues because it should last for long enough to justify the initial um, investment. And, uh, but during that time, it may become very appropriate or the EOSC is one of the, of the aspects to start merging some services and making interoperable some aspects with other infrastructures. So that's the RL6. Welcome. So, Niklas Blomberg, Director of Elixir. So, first, a comment. I was very happy to hear your statement in the beginning that impact can't be determined algorithmically. I took that as a reassurance in the, the importance of peer review also for um, scientific excellence in research infrastructure. And I think that's, that's something we've pushed hard and I think is really important to always emphasize the need for rigorous peer review rather than just numbers. Um, my question, I was very inspired by your vision here at the end, and I was wondering, do you, how do you see the role of research infrastructures in the future missions? Because I think that there, this idea that there are large data sets that may be important for big questions that don't exist yet, I think that could be effect, very effectively piloted within the concept of the, the, the missions in the future program. Um, excellent research infrastructures perform research, not only access to users. So they must have scientists. And it de may depend from one field to the other, but if you want to keep it excellent, this is what is happening. You have scientific staff that has still some 
availability of time and uh, usage of the infrastructure uh, tools to, to produce uh, his or her own uh, science. So uh, in some, uh, in some uh, traditional uh, physics infrastructure, it's called in-house research, but it's a generic. Now, I believe that a good experiment could be to move that a fraction of the in-house research becomes available for producing the data sets that may be requested not by a user group that knows what to do and comes directly to, the, to your uh, infrastructure, but by a system that we may build, try as an experiment, uh, that could be not just a broker of access, but um, an organizer of a possible research path to bring together these data sets. So as a first thing, it could be done by in-house research of the infrastructure. This is my way to, to move along that line, to prove if it works. Sanna? Sanna Sorbrey-Sundet, actress. Uh, thank you for your presentation. And I would like to go a little bit further back in your presentation. You were describing the life cycle of data. Mm in research infrastructures and in relation to EOSC. And I have to say that coming from the environmental field, I was not uh, able to relate to that description so much in the beginning. Because data acquisition is done by the automatized uh, systems in the, in the nature. So in a way that I would probably recommend that this kind of life cycle should be done and went, go, go through with the thematic areas, because there might be differences in the different thematic areas. But it, would be, it is very useful to use and reflect towards EOSC that how the different life cycles are done in terms of data and then reflect it. So the approach is good, but I think that it's just need a little bit of thematic. Yeah. Uh, um, thank you for this comment. Uh, it's certainly uh, correct. Uh, I think even if you have an automated um, detection system uh, uh, of observatories, uh, you have a, a scientist control if something went wrong and the data set is to be thrown away or if it's validated and should go in the time series and, and whatever. So to some degree, even if you have an automatic uh, system, an automatized system, which I think is very good, uh, you do have a, a, a responsible screening of the scientific content and the reliability. Yeah, we are probably not following the user. Yeah, okay, fine, sure, fine. Is it okay? Philippe Segers from uh, Gen C, the Francesc Suisse Gen C and Price, um, the uh, HPC, uh, European HPC uh, research infrastructure that will operate uh, the Euro HPC system. Uh, I have a strong feeling, and uh, this is a shared feeling, that uh, EOSC and Euro HPC work somehow in silo and not uh, with a full uh, um, cooperation and dynamic. So my question is plain simple. What are the management skills that are needed at the European Commission or at project level to make this uh, project work better together? Yeah, I don't know if it's a question of management skills, but uh, I think we, at, in the EOSC uh, meetings, often we make this remark that strong connection with the Euro HPC and the European data infrastructure in general uh, should be kept uh, in mind. I think the, 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 the work groups know that and practice that. Now, um, I have no more answer with that, but it's consciousness is there and, and it's not, uh, I, I cannot say uh, much more, but, but it's clear. I mean, it's very clear. It's, uh, it's two strategic things that can only uh, go together uh, for what is the overlapping uh, area and not, and not diverge or ig be ignored, which is even uh, worse. I'm Guzzi, uh, director of the Generation and Gender program. Our data are collected by the, the nodes, are formatted according to a common format, are documented with metadata. Uh, in the and then in the system. So when I 
thinking about the cloud, what is the plan here? To And so, exactly. I mean, it's all work in progress, but uh, um, I, I don't think it would be. Uh, I, I think there are some needs. The needs is to take advantage of all what exists at its highest level, and so you don't want to duplicate that. And taking advantage means transparently. So if you know that these data are from CESDA, it should be known at all levels that these data are from CESDA. Uh, but at the same time, try to provide an environment where services uh, uh, could uh, be more general than what CESDA is developing on its own scientific scope and could draw from the data of, of CESDA. So this federating core, I think, it's still a title as being discussed. Uh, but uh, again, this is my personal view. It has to really federate very much of the uh, more advanced, a large part of the most advanced research infrastructure along with the most advanced e-infrastructures. Uh, and and to, to get the maximum out of that, has to have them engaged and has to have them non-shadowed by uh, something that would be perceived as uh, unpleasant and is not in the, in, the, in, the, in the meaning of the EOS. So it has to be built. It's not ready. But a first version of that has to be ready by the end of 2020. The risk of not being ready is not to have in a few years any data available anymore. They would be all eaten up in exchange of low-level services by Google, Amazon, mm -hmm. uh, Alibaba, and so on. So we need a public system starting operating. We'll have some faults at the beginning. We will learn by doing, but we have to start uh, uh, next year, at the end of next year. Thank so you. We have now a quick comment from Kat, and then the last question. Kath Brooksbank, I'm the head of training at the European Bioinformatics Institute. And I just had a, a comment, the question from the gentleman behind me. I think at the bottom up level, there is quite a lot of cooperation. So, for example, BioExcel, which is one of the centers of excellence for high performance com computing, is working well with Elixir. And perhaps an instrument could be made available to it to. Uh, encourage these kinds of cooperation from the bottom up. So, Yannick Legray, GI. Uh, I have problem with questions, so I will probably make statement that I will try to disguise again, uh, ask question. Uh, just to say, I, I think that uh, Philip was more uh, speaking about the e-infrastructure not collaborating together, so the EOSC uh, and the EuroHPC, rather than the uh, research infrastructure using using them. So just that. Uh, second, I would just like to make a comment about that one. So you, I think you weren't there yesterday uh, when I, where are you? No. I was in Paris doing something okay. else. So when, when I, uh, I, I propose that uh, to take the best advantage of fair data, you need to have shop services, uh, which are services that are sustainable, helpful, accessible, reusable, and delivered professionally. So th this is something that you can okay. <laughs> shop services for fair data. <laughs> uh, la last, last comment is that I really appreciated that you, you mentioned the point about uh, long-term sustainability for data. Uh, and I do believe that there is a strong need for funding of, of this data to m keep them available. Uh, we, we are trying to advocate for many years to create uh, a data hub backbone in Europe where people could deposit their data that will be kept available. Because so far, uh, there is an issue uh, about ownership of data, and all the funding agencies uh, give away the ownership of the data produced by project. But how can we uh, expect that a project that has been uh, built ad hoc for two or three years period will take care of the data generated by the project over the next decades? And I think that this is an unfair uh, load 
to give to one of the member of the consortium to take care of that. So what could be the model to, to get out of this uh, situation? We need another workshop to answer this <laughs> question. Yes. But please, a a quick answer. question, at, and, and it's also something that is being discussed and, uh, and, and planned. I, I, when I insist on the, on the research um, community and the research infrastructure as one of the uh, organ things that organizes the, the scientific community, it's not the only one, but it does, is that uh, we want to populate the EOSC only with data that are worth the EOSC. And so there is a responsibility that stays with the scientists of knowing how much. We, don't, we will not qualify the success of the EOSC by the number of petabytes, I don't think but by the number of good data sets. How to qualify a priori? <laughs> no, a priori is, is, is the scientific community. I mean, uh, people working in an infrastructure, they know of themselves and they know of the colleagues if they failed or if they had good stuff that is worth the effort of curating and completing the metadata and etc. Effort should be lower by making things automatic as much as you can. But still, there would be some effort. So at the origin, I think, and this is what should make a, 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 a fruitful inter, uh, collaboration between scientists and uh, data technologists, is we don't want to reach exabyte to say that we are successful. We want to reach a abundant library of very uh, reliable data sets that we have the expectation could produce new knowledge if used by other people. So, okay, let me stop here. Thank you.